Sadly, it is not one of the things the Brits took from India. <laughs> but there's still hope. Up in Yorkshire. What's your name? Julian. Julian? Yes. You keep talking about enlightenment. I don't know what you mean by enlightenment because everybody uses that term differently. When I speak about enlightenment here, it's a description of a process where there is a gradual disillusion of identity the seeker goes into practices, which can be, for example, conceptual practices where there is a querying of who am I, which continues to go on and on and on and on. Or there could be deep meditative practices where there is an attempt to actually stop thinking. Or there could be the continuous chanting of mantra. These are various attempts by the being to reach a truth. When these attempts become too difficult for the awareness or the consciousness to remain corporeal, the actual ability to perceive starts to leave the system. And what happens is, is that the identity starts to dissolve gradually. So first, there would be just this experience of bliss, this experience of sort of a light contourlessness. And gradually those contours of the body fall away and then there is this perceiving entity which experiences something around it. And at one point that too falls away. And then there is only the perceiving entity, <clears throat> the early samadhi state. And at one point even that is not there anymore which you only know when you re-enter, because then you again realize that something happened, but there was nothing perceiving nothing. And again, these processes repeat themselves and repeat themselves. So what happens is that at one point there is a detachment from the very materiality of your system, where the perceiving entity does not feel connected to any of this because it is in a cosmic state of perception most of the time. Those are enlightened states. Why enlightened? Because in the history of spirituality, people who had experienced those states were so detached from everything that they were considered to be actually blessed, specially blessed. The emotions don't touch them, you know. One of them has a maggot eating his flesh and he says, go ahead, dear, it's fine, you know, eat what you need to. So he's not materially connected, he's not emotionally touched. His conceptual is limited in its ability to put together coherent, meaningful thoughts in the long run. That is what we refer to here as enlightenment. It is a state of detachment, basically. But it's a state of exalted detachment caused by practices that lead to the consciousness and its ability to perceive exiting the system into a cosmic awareness. So it's a state of um, unidentified perceivingness. Because if you're disregarding being eaten by a, a creature, to me that wouldn't fall under my concept of enlightenment. That sounds like a state of, um, well, just, just silly. Yeah, in a sense I must say it is silly. <laughs> you're right about that, because many enlightened beings really are not in touch anymore with their bodies because they are that 
much in cosmic states of consciousness, which means there is no real identifying with this body. So, enlightenment in its very material description would include the detachment from the body. Most of the time, it is referred to as detachment from the thinking processes and from the emotion. The person that has undertaken those processes has been catapulted into a cosmic consciousness which detaches from the very basis. And because of that detachment and those gradations of detachment, we also have gradations of enlightenment. We can have a person who's conceptually enlightened, but is still in touch, kind of, with the body. Generally, though, you have a state of general detachment, which is why I speak about the importance of reintegration processes, coming back into this, you know. I gave the maggot as a crass example of detachment to the extent where the identity is not connected anymore with the, with the body, yet is aware of its presence, is not connected to the pain of the body. So there is no transformation of the pain, there is simply a detachment, which leads to the ultimate early disintegration of the entire system. If there is no master in charge of the house, anyone can enter and wreak havoc, which is exactly what happens. And it's very sad in a way, because there are so many people that are yearning for that very thing which is actually destroying, rather than conducive to realization of this and a joyous existence. It happens to them, that is different, but when they keep searching for it and are sad because it hasn't happened to them, then they're sad about something silly, as you put it. You talk a lot about bending. Is, is this like a um, kind of recognizing what's conditioned, not buying into what the conditioning is saying? Is this what you mean by bending to the soul? Is, is this true? Well, I feel you've got, you've got a glimpse of what I'm saying in the sense that you do actually discern between the master of the being, the soul, and this conditioning. But the actual process is of bending to that thing. It is an object-subject relationship that is brought in as a first step in this practice. So it is you, Julian. Julian, what's your mother's name? Dorothy. And where were you born? England. Where in England? Yorkshire in Yorkshire. So it would be Julian, son of Dorothy from Yorkshire. You take up that identity as the subject. And then that subject bows down to the object, which is the soul. In the process of doing this over a period of time, at one point Julian disappears, Dorothy disappears, and Yorkshire disappears. And the system becomes an instrument of the truth because it is habituated to bending to the truth, which means it is actually refusing the onslaught of the ego. For discernment, we do, of course, need to know the description of what we are discerning between, certainly. But we keep it at that and we turn away and we turn to the truth. We don't need to know what all that stuff is, finally. You know? So this is a very fascinating process because there's an entire dissolution of identity that happens, but it is, it is not a cosmic dissolution of identity, but a corporeal, terrestrial, present, here and now, eyes open dissolution of identity. And it's magical because you're still entirely connected with what this thing is. Responsibility is taken for... There's no maggot going to be eating your flesh because you won't allow it to even get there in the first place. But it's also an interesting experiment to bend down. Why don't you try that once? Go home this evening and do the Sashtanga Namaskar. It's an ancient Kriya. Sadly, it is not one of the things the Brits took from India. <laughs> but there's still hope. Up in Yorkshire, 
Would you consider that? I feel that's what I do all the time, is, is recognize that there's, there's this buying into a conceptual identity which is not true. Do you bend down? I don't know what you mean by bending. I'm talking about physically. Physically. <laughs> Actually go into a... Uh, see? Oh, I saw a no. smile there. Well, see what happens if you try that. Why not? You have nothing to lose. When you go home this evening, take a moment to actually bend down, prostrate physically and see what it does to you. It's a very powerful kriya to bring surrender into the system. Okay. You don't have to if you don't want to, it's a suggestion. Be glad that you're not my shishya. satsang with Maharishi Kapriti this Sunday. To know more, click the link in the description below.